It's time for Tales of Terror, only on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Hello, strange world. Welcome to the Aldergate Papers. My name is Adrian Ward, and these singed and crumpled pages are my diary, a record of the final days of my former life. I remember almost nothing of the story they contain. All I know is that it ends with me very nearly being killed and that it may not be entirely unrelated to some of the strange things that seem to be happening lately. If there's any truth in the odd fragments of memory that I just can't seem to shake, well, there are things you deserve to know. Things that may help you to understand what's going on, and what's coming. We left our hero in filth, in pain, and in a sentient art gallery. We rejoin him at the Bloodletters Club. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bloodletters, don't feel too bad. It is an exhaustingly exclusive institution, and frankly, I'd never heard of it myself. All you need to know for the moment, which is about all I'm able to recall offhand, is that the Bloodletters Club... Well, whatever else it may be, it knows how to feed a chap when he's hungry. This is Day 4, Part 3, Up From the Ashes. It is the fourth day of the return to Aldergate. The time and place of writing is around one o'clock in the afternoon, at a secluded table in one corner of the Bloodletters Club. We begin. <sighs> there we are. Very fine indeed. And a tab of dextro and a drop of caffeine to finish with, these which alone separate the human from the brute. <laughs> At the very least, they're what separates you from that spherical old bugger by the fire. He must be nearly cooked through by now. Come back tomorrow and you'll see him on the menu. Filet of retired colonel, basted in brandy with a side of side whiskers. <laughs> Come along now. No time for stupors, however well earned. Got to kick that butter-clogged brain into gear. Yes. <sighs> Diary. Where were you when you left off? Parata. Yes. You'll have to become an art lover, self old slug, if you're going to make a habit of eating like this. Parata will keep you in fighting trim. Took you a square half an hour to escape from her embrace this morning. Underneath the paintings and sculptures and worryingly tentacular, yes, well, behind the masterpieces, her innards are mostly ramps and platforms, and she switches them up when you're not looking. One wrong turn, and you landed on a sort of enclosed island cluster, circling one of her three great immobile spines. You went round twice before you realized you'd got to go back the way you'd come. Then you'd got to do a full orbit around the perimeter to find a branch that would take you back down to the Ré de Chaussée Surélevé. If you didn't know better, and you're not certain that you do, you'd think she'd done it on purpose. Spiteful little mezzanine. Nevertheless, you have weighed Parata in the balances and found you like her. Taken all in all, she's all right. Hmm. You cannot quite say the same for these mask people. 
The jury remains steadfastly out where they're concerned. They probably ought to be watched. <laughs> but, of course, they probably wouldn't have it any other way. They are actors, after all. Or something like that. Performance artists, perhaps, if there's a difference. Some oh-so-advanced evolution of that general concept. This much you do know. Last night, that stage of theirs was the focal point of what sounded at least like a frenzied mob. And on this weirdly warm November morning after, the pent looked like the scene of a massacre. At first you thought there'd been a massacre. To a chap who's been brooding over a butchered buddy, the sight of severed limbs scattered willy-nilly o'er the commons hits pretty dashed close to home. These were more rubber than real, or else the fellow you saw playing keepy-uppy with a human head would have concussed himself. Still, inelegant timing. Made you quite angry for a moment. Until you realized that this alfresco Guignol must have been in the works since well before poor Sammy met her end. No doubt the show must go on. Oh, incidentally, there appear to be two distinct varieties of mask indigenous to the Altergate Pentangle. The common, or garden, mask is the sort you've seen hitherto. The sort of auxiliary drone, quietly getting on with things. The other breed is far more decorative. This morning, whilst the lesser cousins were collecting up dismembered bits and piling blood-stained planks onto a pushcart, a half-dozen of these fancy masks were sort of hanging about the place, recovering from the night's debauch. A brooding, angular woman, vaping up a cloud bank under the scholar's tree. A spry fellow of advancing years passing a bottle round with a set of artificially conjoined triplets. They all had their masks pushed up on top of their heads so you couldn't see them properly. But then there was the girl. <laughs> yes, the girl. Pretty little thing, topless in a pair of harlequin tights, doing split stretches on the grass. When she leaned forward to grasp an ankle, you found yourself looking into a great chalk-white face. A mask, as you said, but not like the drones' masks. This was smooth, stark, featureless except for one exaggerated left eye. He had watched you as you once again fumbled your front door key. <laughs> ah, distractions. And, what with getting knotted up in Parata, you were already later than you'd intended in getting home. The hour of your appointment with Baz drew nigh. Then you discovered that showering with a wounded paw you don't want getting wet is a terribly ticklish procedure. Then the stuff from the Sir Reggie collection that you'd taken for shampoo turned out to be some sort of gooey, lavender-scented lotion. It took ten minutes and half your own bottle of Kingsley to free yourself of it. By the time you stumbled out of the bathroom, eyes burning and smelling like a linen closet, You'd have had to pull an Archimedes to have any hope of making it to the Keys by nine o'clock. Nudity may be all the rage hereabouts, but it's not your style, even on an unseasonably warm day. So you begged off, climbed up to the library, and, after waving your phone like a conductor's baton, managed to shoot off a text blaming urgent business and offering to buy her lunch instead. You got her response just as you were sadly consigning those John Mintons to the wastebasket. Ahem. Meet Rhodes House Noon? No. Oh. Ahem. That's in all caps, by the way. Baz hasn't got an inside voice when she texts. Anyhow. 
Meet Rhodes House Noon? Greedy Baz. Well, this left you with three unstructured hours, the first of which you spent unreeking the havoc of last night. You bunged everything with bloodstains onto the landing, and hung your poor, ick-befouled Chesterfield over the newel post in the entry hall. You can't forget to have it cleaned. This Indian summer won't last forever. Is that all right to say? Indian summer doesn't seem pejorative on its face, but is bound to have some sort of ghastly history behind it. Ah, well, who doesn't these days? Hmm. Anyhow, eventually you got the place looking a bit less like the wreck of the Hesperus. You found fresh sheets and hung them over the banister. With luck, by the time you want them, the memory of Sir Reggie's mothballs will have faded. Then, since you now share an island with Savile Row, you slid into this dapper little number that came in just before you fled the New World, hot off the fingers of that emergent wunderkind William Westershot. Chocolate Vicuña Wool Blend. Dazzling. You sent Baz a picture of it to shame the little pest. If she intended to be an expensive date, you would dashed well see to it that she dressed the part. Realizing that this was the most vice-chancellorly you've looked since your arrival, you thought you might as well take the opportunity to walk the grounds. To see, that is to say, and to be seen. A good old saunter about your new educational empire. Do you suppose the BBC will ever make a miniseries about the Adrian Ward years at Aldergate? This morning's stroll could be rendered as a montage, with some sort of 1920s Parisian jazz bouncing along in the background. A.W. stopping to sniff a late-blooming gypsophila in the sheltered gardens of Whipple College. A.W. strutting up Queen's Parade, turning heads from Delora to Buckminster. A.W. exchanging amiable nods with the booksellers and antique dealers in Faymarket Square. A.W. striding purposefully down the backs, past Pell Parvis, Lytton, Tozan, Gambrel, Newgrave, Guildford, Warden. A.W. pausing in University Place to enjoy a close harmony rendition of Buckley's Grace by an all female quartet in barber pearl suits and straw boaters. A.W. forgetting his fears and cares as the music washes over him. A.W. forgetting his injured hand. A.W. applauding heartily at Song's conclusion. A.W. saying words that a nice vice-chancellor oughtn't. <laughs> In front of guests as well. You quite startled a trio of well-dressed Korean women. As one, they released their matching rolly bags and began whispering behind their hands. They stared at you as if you'd done a trick and might be about to do another. Bah. Ah, well. The university doesn't court tourism, but we don't discourage it as violently as we did a few centuries ago, and it's generally regarded as poor form to frighten or offend visitors if one can help oneself. You bobbed your head in rueful apology and hobbled off down the high street, trying not to weep. It had been your intention to walk all the way down to the far four, finish the tour, as it were, and maybe pop in and surprise old Gina Varden. Also, that young ogre Renzo Ray is at Bester College now. Just think, a ward scholar making it to Aldergate. Not that you scouted the chap. That's Maria's job. You just signed the checks. Anyhow, young Renzo's controversial work on genomic neologism may end up being but a footnote in his hagiography. Rumors are but rumors, but these are insistent, and they whisper that he's actually put together a tolerably good rugby squad. R slash Aldergate is abuzz with talk of surprising Oxbridge this year. We haven't taken the ivory teacup since 1917, but this may be the year.
You believe that when you see it. And you were hoping to see it. Maybe catch them during practice, sneak a glimpse of these legends in the making. As you headed towards Bester, however, it occurred to you that you hadn't actually revisited Hobson Muse yet. Not that you'd been avoiding it, naturally, but, well, it had to be done eventually, and if it were done, when it is done, and so on and so forth. So you left the far four for another day, and followed the drunken medieval windings of Lamp Street towards the address you once called home. Ah, quick geographical footnote. Lamp Street, where I lived after Elden House, runs through a sort of in-betweeny part of the city of Aldergate. A bit to the west of Lamp are the little districts that have been claimed by the nearby colleges, a Warden, Guildford, and Newgrave, as sort of unofficial fiefdoms to catch the overflow from the residence halls. Then, if you go a bit east of Lamp, you get into the old city itself, commerce and trade and all that disreputable stuff. Betwixt and between, Lamp winds through a sort of unaffiliated scholastic slum, ad hoc living and working space for students that have left their colleges behind, but still need roofs over their heads. Anyhow, Lamp runs from the High Street up to Witch Street, only about half a mile as the crow flies, but almost three times that walking. Certain inconsiderate persons have been known to cut through Cababalon to save time, and through Max Ant, too, if your shins are willing to risk the wrath of Max the Younger's cane. Moving on. Ah, memories. It is good to be back. It may be a while before you actually venture into Cababalon. You haven't entirely dismissed the possibility that last night's feast had something to do with your nightmares. The important thing is that it's still there for you if you need it. It's all still there. Lamp Street stands as you left it, from its knobbly cobbles to its cavernous drains to the dust in the windows of Maxwell's antiquarian books and curiosities. All same as it ever was. Except for Hobson Muse. The Muse is gone. Well, obviously. That is to say, the old Doss House hasn't been rebuilt. And it hasn't been properly not rebuilt, either. You wouldn't say you'd given the matter too much thought, but about 80% of you was expecting to see Hobson Muse 2.0 or 3.0, or whatever. For all you know, the thing could have been burning down and popping up again like the Pampas for centuries. Then again, you'd about 19% melancholy hopefulness that... Um, that you'd find a grassy area between the terraces. Maybe a picturesque bit of ruined stone wall. A brass plaque in memoriam. As if anybody wanted to remember. Silly, obviously. But not as silly as what's taken the muse's place. It's... you hardly know what to call it. A castle? A monastery? A joke? You've really no idea. It stands where the muse stood, and, well, at least it looks pretty well fireproof. It also looks completely out of place. Whatever its function, defensive, clerical, or humorous, it's made of that brownish-gray stone that's so popular hereabouts. And not in Aldergate itself. Wouldn't catch the college's building with local stone, and the vernacular's mostly brick and timber. Still, you recognize the stuff at once. It's what the Barbican's made of, and St. Guntram's down in Quelling's Mumley. This newcomer that's taken over the muse's footprint looks like a cross between the two, and an uncomfortable one. It looks... Uh, uh, vocabulary fails. You're not an architect, and you can't quite get your head around just what offends you about it, apart from its existing in the first place. 
its angles aren't quite right somehow. The proportions are off. There's a hint of frustrated dwarfism about it, as if it wanted to grow into something fearful and grand, but found it hadn't room. Now it's just sulking and trying to look tough. The doors are strapped with as much ironwork as the wood will hold, and there are rectangles of mule-colored brick built into the stone, as if it had started off with windows and then thought better of it. The residual impression is of an angry, frightened, myopic thing. It squints down suspiciously on poor, innocent Lamp Street, as though expecting a sudden attack of Visigoths. Seems a bit much for something built on the ashes of your old flat, surely. There's been an effort made to evoke some solemn history, but it's more Disneyland than Dark Ages. Baudrillard would have a field day. And then there's the really funny thing. There's an inscription over the doors, carved into the stone in Abandon Hope or Ye Who Enter Here sort of letters. But the thing is, the message itself is actually quite nice. Quid voles illud fac? Now, you haven't studied Latin in ages, but you puzzled it out and recognized bad old St. Augie. Nasty piece of work. Didn't care for Jews or women much. Still, that crack of his about love first and the rest nowhere has always stuck with you as pretty good, for a mumbler at least. Could this heap come lately be a church? In Aldergate? That would be something new under the sun. You must make inquiries. Baz will know. It's not a university building, of course, but new construction of any sort inside Aldergate is always a to-do. The permits and permissions and things it must have taken to cart so much stone into the city must have been a bureaucratic orgy. Not that it matters, of course, but... Well, as you were standing outside Mac's hand and quirking an eyebrow at the thing, one of those death metal doors swung open. Out stepped a lithe young person in green surgical scrubs. Tall, lean, with a snarly black pixie cut and a certain animal grace. You looked, and they must have sensed you looking, because they turned, and you locked eyes. Only for a moment, you quickly engrossed yourself in the bargain cart of tattered bits and odd volumes Max the Younger keeps on the pavement in dry weather. The trapped thing awoke suddenly in every drain on Lamp Street, filling your burning ears with the echoes of its thrashing. When you glanced up again, they were just vanishing round the bend, headed for Witch Street and all points north. Those eyes, eh, self? Just for an instant, at a distance, but you've never seen eyes like those. Dark pools you could drown in, hit you right in the breath. <laughs> Come now. You sound like a smitten schoolboy. But really, those eyes. How does a person carry that much grief, that much sadness inside themselves? It hits you like a blow, the sheer weight of it. And you could feel them carrying it somehow. That utterly rigid self-control, frozen in brow and jaw. Such an air of imposed calm about them. Lips tightened against whatever they're holding inside. Eyes that will not weep and cannot sleep. Sweet mercy, you sound a prat. Why are you going on like this? Can't say, really. Just that moment of connection. And there was just this sort of finality about them. A knowingness, you know? 
not quite despair and not quite acceptance, just that terrible understanding. Ah, so that's it. You're projecting. Well, obviously. It's not them at all, is it? They'd stubbed their toe, or lost their kitten, or got new contact lenses. But what about you, eh? Enough about the eyes. What about the beholder? <sighs> Perhaps it's just all the thinking you've been doing lately. But in that moment, in that place, they looked the way you'd felt. That's all. Yes. Bah. Well, get on with it. On to the Lignum Arms and the Bloodletters Club and a most fascinating lunch. Ah, yes. Lunch. Third most important meal of the day. But you'd skipped breakfast, and a morning spent a-roaming had worked up even your unreliable appetite. After a self-conscious moment spent picking theatrically through Max's aunt's bargain bin, you decided you'd given sweet sorrow enough of a head start, and carried on after them. You didn't try to catch up, didn't want to catch up, so you certainly weren't disappointed when you didn't. Now, the west end of Witch Street runs right up to the eastern gates of Gambrel College, and when Lamp Street spat you out, you instinctively turned left. It took a minute or two for your autopilot to click off, and then you had to stand about for a bit and pretend you were sightseeing. You must be a better actor than you'd have guessed, because one of the Gambrel porters came trotting out, brandishing pamphlets and spouting jolly history lessons about the college's facade. Quite interesting, actually. Did you know old Muhammad Ali Pasha spent a year at Aldergate? No, no, you didn't. But it seems that when he was nicking the casing stones off Akhet Khufu, he shipped a bargeful up to his old alma mater along with a few cultural pretties that were too nice to smash and too un-Islamic to keep lying about. Now Great Giza's skin gleams on the Gambrel Gatehouse. Ahem, <clears throat> the doorway of ghosts, you ought to say. Well, that's what the porter claimed people call it, though you've certainly never heard them do it. It may not all be myth-making, either. You'd always rather wondered how Aldergate came by a witch street. Well, per your informative pamphlet, witch is a cheerful medieval corruption of lich. Lich Street. Corpse Road, you know. The preferred route for carting away Aldergate's dead. Plus a change, eh? Ugh. Anyhow... At length you escaped, with a smile and a wave and a fistful of literature. About face, and off to your date with Baz. Such at least was the plan. Many a slip twixt cup and lip, self. Many a babe in the woods. Many a nail in the coffin. Ah well, onwards to Rhodes' house. Well then, and there I fear we must leave our hero for the nonce. Not too much of a cliffhanger, I hope. We know that lunch turned out well, at least. Still, it wouldn't hurt to fear just a little for his safety. He is walking wounded, after all, and as for what's likely to happen to a chap who somehow gets diverted between point A and point B, and winds up at this bloodletters club. Well, we shall just have to see, shan't we? Join me every second Sunday at thealdergatepapers.com. Find the Aldergate Papers on Apple Podcasts as well, 
and spread the word, won't you? This may be my story, but I fear that it's likely to become everybody's problem. Until next time, I am and shall remain your humble servant, Adrian Ward. You're listening to Tuesday Terrors on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow is our weekly anthology for science fiction and fantasy as Lothar Tuppen brings you Wednesday Wonders. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of amazing audio or find the Wednesday Wonders feed in your favorite podcast player. And thank you for listening, everybody. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.